She is on the rebound from her second husband, a drunk newspaper man who swept her off her feet in Dallas and took her to California. It went straight downhill for five years. She didn't mind the liquor, even tolerated a black eye now and then, but she had despised the jealousy and left. Her first husband is dead. She drinks some now herself. She misses her band. They meet at the railroad station. He's a lot older, but she likes his big open grin. Hi there, sunshine, she says. Instead of going on where they were going, they go to supper. They like each other's hands. She is recently divorced and his first wife recently dead. It is the summer of 1942, and as usual, America is at war. They are married six weeks later. He gives her a small ring with tiny diamonds. She gives him one son. They will live together 15 years. Both of their lives will never be what they are again. When the season was over, he had to find work. Mostly he did carpentry or sold hardware. One winter he worked in a slaughterhouse. He hated the pigs screaming and quit after three days. He never ate bacon again. He started collecting spoons as souvenirs from all the towns he played in. They had little pictures of famous landmarks on them. At night, he'd lay them out on the bed in the hotel and look at them. It always made him feel better. He saw the first electricity light, the first horseless car, the first aeroplane, and many other first-time gadgets. He thought they were all just play pretties. None of them will stick, he said. He was 32 years old when he finally went up to the majors the summer of the Great War of 1918. He could still catch like a wall and throw like fire, but he couldn't hit. It was a damn foul lines. He was up for only one year, then shipped down to Houston. They made him a player manager because of his age, so he ended up making a name in the Texas League. During the 1920s and 30s, it was the meanest of them all. The Denver Post Tournament is in its third day. She has a date to the game with the sax player. From the bleachers, she watches a woman in a black dress down the money seats lean over the wire and kiss a big, rough-looking catcher. It's her old piano teacher. God, I hope he's holding his breath. She gets so tickled, she pees her pants. That night in the lounge, she sees the two of them again. She's playing and they're dancing, and for some reason, the moment is so perfect, she just tears up the goddamn St. Louis blues. The name of the speakeasies on the wall behind her in glittery letters. It says the Satin Dugout. But the Denver cops naturally call it the Foul Line. He married a Catholic woman. He was mystified by the religion, but seldom saw her. When he wasn't playing or managing ball, he hopped freights. He said it was to find work, but mostly it was just to go see something else. She died of cancer of the throat in 1940. Once he told a young busher with a promising arm, your life just turns into a bucket full of stories with a little bitty hole in the bottom. Or a bucket full of holes with a little bitty story in the bottom, she told him years later, giggling. He is cussing the Yankees. It's the final game of the World Series. He is cussing the television. Baseball should never have been put on television. He cusses the players. All they care about is the money. The pitchers take forever to throw the damn ball. She can hear him from the kitchen. His brother is with him. He says he has come to say goodbye, but she doesn't like his eyes or the way they look at her. She pours a small whiskey. The Yankees win. The television is off. The game is over. He is 73 years old. He talks two hours with his brother. The brother will never mention what was said. She comes in and takes his hand. It's time. Her fingers move lightly over his big knuckles like she is playing the piano. He feels himself suddenly come loose and fly out in a great high and familiar arc and in some infinite and secret place she flies away with him. <laughs>